Hey everyone, welcome to Proudly Jewish Conversations on Israel and Jewish Identity. Uh, it's been a while where I thought about having an episode that deals with the music that's coming out of Israel as a response to October 7th. And I, I've been hearing some wonderful things in all kinds of levels. And, and instead of my delving into it, I wanted to find someone who who knew it better than I did, who could comment on it better than I did. I did a bit of research and uh, stumbled upon someone who is not someone that you should stumble upon, someone that we should all know. Uh, he hosts the Israel Hour Radio. Uh, it's been on for 25 years or just about. More than that, actually. But More yes. than that? Yes. More than that. Well, uh, uh, Josh Schroen, welcome to Proudly Jewish. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Ayal. It is uh, wonderful to join you. I appreciate this. And, you know, I, I when I was looking, doing my research and thinking about this particular topic, the response to, to October 7th musically uh, coming out of Israel, I saw that you were you were touching, you've already addressed this. Um, you've created a playlist that deals with this. You've, you were speaking, you wrote, there's an article that, that, that touches upon specifically this. Um, can you address to our audience here, how Israeli musical artists have given voice to the, the, the sentiment in Israel following October 7th? Well, sure. Uh, first of all, you you couldn't have asked me at a better time because uh, I'm currently I, I we we made Aliyah five months ago oh. uh, from from New Jersey, and I'm currently back in the states, uh, touring all over the place, speaking about Israel and Israeli music's response to October seventh. Mm. So this is very much on my mind these days, and and really has been ever since uh, ever since that fateful day. Because the artists have just been incredible in in helping us understand the vibe of Israel during this difficult time. Uh, for one thing, the artists have been all over the country trying to make people happy, uh, mm. going to army bases and having these joyous concerts for the soldiers and going to hotels where people have been displaced and helping them find a little joy during this difficult time. And and just have been doing everything they can to to help the country cope with this tragedy. But as for the songs themselves, well, they've also, you know, so many, so so often people say, "I have no words." Mm -hmm. You know, they hear a tragedy, there there are no words. Well, many of these artists have found the words, and I find that whenever I play some of this music on my podcast, people say, you know. There were there was one particular song or two songs on the list that that really just put into words exactly what I'm feeling, and uh, they're helping us connect to this tragedy no matter where in the world you you are. And I I can get into specific examples if you'd like. I, I would. I, I think this would be it'd be an amazing opportunity to uh, to share some clips with my audience. Uh, you know, if you if you point us in the right direction, telling us you know this this song does this or this song does that um i'd be i think that i think that i would love to be exposed to these songs and i think that my audience would as well um you know in terms of giving comfort to people these these artists going around to as you said going to the people wherever they may be and reaching out one if i am imagine that if i think about it and i don't see it for myself i'm assuming that these are going to be songs of solace, of comfort, perhaps songs of uh, that you not quite you might hear it at, at Iskor or Shiva, but something that's mournful. Is, is that right, or is there other dimen Are there other dimensions? And and well, yeah, there there are lots of dimensions actually. And and every week on my show, I tell that I tell my listeners I'm going to pull your heart in a gazillion different directions because that's what this music is doing. Right. But more than anything, I've uh, divided, and in my presentation that I've been giving, I've divided the songs into three categories. And that is, uh, first, the uh, songs of, of pain and loss and sadness and tragedy and just 
difficulty. Right. Uh, they're all very painful to listen to. Uh, the next category is songs reminding us of the plight of the hostages. Yeah. And the third one on a totally different level, a complete 180 songs of unity and strength and optimism and hope and understanding that, yes, we will get through this. And yes, we will rebuild. And yes, we'll be stronger than before. To start at the end for a moment, the, the unity. It, it seemed to me that there was what you just spoke about, the comforting, although there's this, there's an outpouring, an outpouring of wanting to hold each other as a community, as one large, small community, right? Israel's so small. Uh, I think everybody knows somebody that was, um, that was, I was going to say, impacted in, in just to, to use a soft euphemism uh, in some way by the by the war or October 7th itself. And there's a need to hug each other and hold each other. Um, so I, I get the unity. And one question I have before I ask for you to get into these, because I'd love to hear more, is was there a, a an outpouring of creativity as well from the point of view of these artists in terms of, you know, there's there's this desire to, in other words, before October 7th, People are making music and they're making music now. Have the themes changed or uh, or is it also that the amount of creative um, output has, has increased? The amount, I'm not sure about. I mean, these artists have always been pretty busy. Israel's biggest yeah. musical stars uh, yeah. are always releasing things. But I think after October 7th, everyone felt they needed to put their own personal take on, on what had happened. Right. So for some artists that was, that was, let me share the pain that I've been feeling or, or let me uh, just use this song as a, as an outlet to cry uh, and to, to share the grief. Others have been saying, I feel inspired to bring the country together and to say, you know, Yachad ninatzach, together right. we will win. And uh, those those kinds of songs. So everyone wanted to to say I, I I everyone wanted to try to bottle up the the mood of the country in their own right. unique way. And it's been so interesting to see how they've all dealt with it. What's on my mind is what was the first reaction musically? Was it loss? Was it you said loss and pain? Was that the was that the first you know the, the first songs that came out at the beginning? Was it that? Uh, I, I'm thinking particular of, of this song. You know, I'm over here in Portland, Oregon, in the States, and I, I'm listening to Israeli music as best as I can, but I'm not there. And the song that hit me over here was Harbu Darbu at the beginning. And I don't know where that fit, that where that came. So can you tell us more? What was the what was coming out in the beginning? Was it loss and pain or was it the sentiment that we get in that song? Well, I, I, I can tell you uh, the first two songs that I remember hearing, and they're on opposite ends of the spectrum. Uh, one was Moledet by Hanan Ben Ari. And that was a song, I think, of, of loss and pain with a, a, a touch of, uh, you know, we will we will rebuild. This is a country worth fighting for and and we will rebuild. And, and if anyone's interested on our YouTube channel, we have a, a translated version of that of that particular song. With well, some, Eng English subtitles. I'm going to share a clip. I think we'll do that right here, and um, and let the you know let people listen for themselves. <laughs> So we've just heard part of Moledet by Hanan ben Ari. Uh, I encourage everyone to listen to the full song. Now, there's one lyric that I saw, you know, and as well that I heard, and I, it jumped out at me when I listened to it. Um, you know, it, it talks about hope. It talks about um, I sing to you this an ancient song and what have you. But there's a song, as a line uh, that's Hamatok vehamav. The, the the bitter the sweet and the bitter and I'm assuming that's an, an intentional um, echo of another song 
that is part of the pantheon, you know, the, the tapestry of Israeli and Jewish music, Al Kol Ele, right? Al Amar Is do you, did, does that am I am I reading that right? I would say so. I mean, you know, every, two people can look at the same song lyrics and get something very different, but that would be my guess. And that is so much of the Israeli experience, this combination of bitter and sweet, this combination of, yes, we deal with a lot of tragedy and a lot of difficulty, but we always believe that in, in, in the, the hatikva, the hope that is is coming for, for better days, uh, yeah, and that's that's been a, a a good. If you want to sum up the the kind of music that's come out, that's it: mar and matok, wow. bitter and sweet, all at the same time. And and you spoke of two songs. I, we talked about Moladet Hanan ben Ari, and on another spectrum, there was another song. Right. So Hanan ben Ari's Moladet was probably the first song that I heard, and I think the very next day, uh, another song that you brought up earlier when we were talking offline is Am Yisrael Chai by uh, Eyal Golan. And I, I, I've i talked with my listeners sometimes online, and I, I ask, what do you think is going to be the song that people remember, or songs that people will, will remember 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now as people remember this time in history? And everyone seems to agree that that song, Am Yisrael Chai by Eyal Golan, has this kind of staying power that wow. people will remember for a long time. Why? Why is that? What's what's happening in the song? What's oh, the... it's just so patriotic and and so optimistic, and uh, it 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 touches on religion. Hakadosh Baruch Hu Shomer Aleinu, God watches over us, uh, appealing to one uh, aspect, one uh, demographic of the population, and uh, the the various uh, Israeli patriotism appealing to another demographic. It, it just has something for everyone. It's fun to listen to. It's good to dance to. It, it just makes you feel good inside every time I hear it. You mentioned that there's something for everyone in that song and that there's also this, there's a religious component that taps to a, another demographic. Now it tapped to, the, I, I, I get that it'll tap to the demographic that is already that T that is really religious or more spiritual, what have you. It seems to me that in times of distress, in times of war, uh, in times of personal loss at that doesn't involve the, even not, even not at the level of October seventh, but just individual loss in families. People often turn to religion or spirituality for comfort. Are you seeing that as well? I love that question, and yes, the an the answer is yes. But uh, in Israel, the the line between religious and secular seems to me, and again, I'm, I'm kind of new in the country, so I, I can't tell you exactly, but it seems to me a lot more blurred than it is outside Israel. Right. Um, you have artists like Yishai Rebo, who is an Orthodox guy, uh, comes out with tzitzit, but he's a very modern looking uh, singer with a guitar, and he sings very modern sounding songs that are all about God and all about the Jewish experience and all about tefillot prayers and and uh, and yes, he has a huge fan base among those who are religious and a huge fan base among those who are secular. And uh, that was evidenced in Madison Square Garden. He sold out Madison Square Garden in September. I wasn't there, but my son was, and he said, "You saw everybody there. You saw with uh, you know uh, Haredi people with their with with long pace, long curls, and you saw the most secular people as well." So, but and, and that's an, an amazing phenomenon with him. In Israel, the Jewish experience is 
just as cultural as it is religious. Yeah. So everyone, uh, you, you've been hearing a lot of artists sing uh, uh, lines from the Psalms. Shir alam alot esa enaya leharim. I lift my eyes up to the heavens. And these are secular Israeli artists that just know this stuff from from their entire upbringing, yeah. and uh, they are quoting these lines that just everybody knows, whether you believe that there's a God listening or not. Uh, you know these lines, and they they are meaningful to you. And wow. I, I mean, I I could talk for a long time about this this amazing uh, you know the amazing fusion of religious and secular in Israeli society. And to continue that, just for a brief moment, you know, I'm a cantor. I, I'm a cantor uh, uh, in in Portland, Oregon, at Neve Shalom, a conservative synagogue. Grew up in the Spanish Portuguese synagogue in Montreal. Synagogue liturgy is is my life. Uh, my children are my life, but liturgy has been my life for many, many years. And I was listening to this artist, uh, I believe on your playlist, and you know he has this amazing dance song with Omer Adam uh, about a, a revolution of joy that that came out of you know not you know, a few years ago, I believe. And um, and now there's this song that's called Achenu Kol Bet Israel. Uh, all the whole house of Israel are. Um, our brothers or our family. Achenu kol bet Yisrael anetunim b'tzara Ha'omdim ben bayam ba'avi uven baya basha Ha'kadosh baruch hu yerachem alem ve'yotziem mitzara you know, Lior Nachkis is who I'm talking about. Lior Nachkis, and he has this song, he has songs that are like dance songs, and he's doing this that, that jumped out at me. I don't know if that's, he's not Ishai Ribo. He's not no, doing. No, not at all. And that's that, I, I actually bring that song up in my presentation that I've been uh. giving because I find it amazing to turn on the radio in, in Israel, mainstream Israeli secular radio in Israel, and hear a song like this. Here is a guy with tattoos all up and down his arms, but he has this, this Jewish neshama, this Jewish soul that uh, comes out when it needs to, you know? Uh, not not all his songs are about prayer or Judaism or or, or lines from the liturgy, but every but in in times like this, it is so relevant and and it's something that the entire country can can get behind this feeling that look, I don't know who's up there listening whether whether you believe in God or you don't. Uh, I we can all we can just pray. For better times, we can pray that God will bring salvation, or that salvation will come, however it comes, uh, and 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 for a release of the hostages and for better times ahead. And it's it seems to me, as you said, that they they grew up with this as part part of the culture. It it underlines there's our the Jewish people. We're a people with a religion. This is these are our this is our faith. This is these are our legends. These are our our stories of our people. This is these are the texts of our ancestors. These are our prayers of our people, and it that's that resonates with me greatly. I, I did a program, by the way, last night at my congregation on the, the genius of Paul Simon, and several people came up to me afterwards and said, "You know, we don't come to services, but we come looking for community occasions, and this this brought us together." Okay, uh, there, but there's this crossover of what what religious. Part of a, a, this Jewish identity is now. Before, instead of me pontificating, I, let's go back, and I'd love to explore your your categories. And I don't know where you'd like to start, but maybe we can start at the first one that you mentioned, loss and pain. Um, unless you want to move to the other one, is I'd love to go through your categories, and if you could point us or illustrate one or two songs that um, that underscore those themes. I think that would that would be wonderful. Sure. Um, so starting with that category of loss and pain, uh, one song that I find very difficult and very meaningful is uh, mostly a rap song. And and it's amazing, how, you know, in the in the states, I don't think I listen to much rap music. In Israel, it can be extremely meaningful and very relevant, and and just just to have a just really talk to your soul. Um, it's by a, a pop, pop singer named Odeya and a rapper named Easy. All right. And it's called Choref Esrim Vishalosh. So first of all, the title itself 
uh, echoes back to uh, an, an earlier song in Israel, Choref Shivim Vishalosh, the winter of 1973. It was written in, it was written about the children who were born after the Yom Kippur War, and now those children have turned 18, and they are uh, saying, you know, when we were born after the Yom Kippur War, you promised us that we weren't going to have to go to the army. And now here we are. We have to go to the army. What's that all about? You have to keep your promises. So that was the old song from 1991 or 1992. And so when this song came out, Choref Esrim Vishalosh, the winter of 23, 2023, uh, that obviously made everybody sit up and, and take notice. Uh, but this song is, is very, very different. This song is a conversation with God. You know, we're talking about this blurred line between re religious and secular. A conversation with God, how could you do this? How yeah. could you take these people away? What did they do? What was their crime? I, I want to talk to you, Father. They keep calling, saying to Father, referring to God, uh, about, you know, that you, we call you in our prayers a merciful God. Well, where's your mercy? And, yeah. and, and is anybody even listening when I pray? And these are the kinds of questions, you know, you, you talk about a, a return to spirituality during times like these, and you're right. But on the other hand, for some, you might be pulling away from spirituality a little bit and saying, if there's a God, how can how can God allow something like this? Yeah. And that's who we are. We're Yisrael. We wrestle with God. And uh, that's that's okay. And that's what makes us who we are. <laughs> של חורף 23, חמלה ששרפו לה את הבית, מוסר שרפו לו את הראש, בצער רב ויגון קודר, פתאום המנהיגים שלי הפסיקו לדבר, חיללו לי את השבת והמשיח מאחר, זוכרת שהימרנו, מתי זה ייגמר? Do we have another one for loss and pain, or do we want to go to your other category? I mean, I can share a whole bunch. Uh, you know what? I'll, I'll just give you one more that I find sure. uh, pretty meaningful, and it's by a singer by the name of Benaya Barabi, okay. and he's joined forces with a number of survivors from the Nova Festival. Uh, uh, so much of so many of the songs that we hear are all about the those who lost their lives and mourning for those people. But what about the survivors? How do they move on? How do they go through life with the with, with what they've experienced and and this this constant reminder of pain? And so he sings along with them uh, a song called Zebeseder. It's okay, but the rest of the line is Zebeseder Loliot Beseder. Uh -huh. It's okay not to be okay. And really, the gist of the song is: no matter how you're going through this process, no matter how you're dealing with it personally whether you sit in your room all day and cry or whether you go through life and, and pretend it never happened or whatever whatever you do to, to cope with this grief, it's all okay. It's all acceptable. Wow. Nobody's judging you. No, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Uh, and I haven't heard the song. Looking forward to hearing it. <laughs> זה בסדר לפגוע את כל בוקר ולמרות הכל בסוף לקום זה בסדר לא להיות נורמלי זה בסדר לא לומר מילה זה בסדר לקוד עד הבוקר בחושך מלא תקווה The second category was dealing with the hostages this, this terrible tragedy uh, you know, when when Israel has, has had one person taken hostage, uh, the country goes into crisis and 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 can be years of of a certain type of grief. And here you've got you had hundreds, and now we have just a over about 130 or so hostages um, still uh, not returned home. So, how has Israel been dealing with that musically? Shortly after October seventh. Uh, Idan Reichel, who is one of Israel's most 
successful singer songwriters over the past, I don't know, 25 years or so. Uh, he writes songs that he sings, and then he writes a lot of songs that other people sing. I see. So he asked Roni Dalumi to join him on a song where, where she is the, the vocalist. And the song is called Tahzor Return. Mm -hmm. And in it, uh, Roni Dalumi is singing, just return. You don't need to give me prior notice. Just show up. Uh, I, I, I'm here waiting for you. And you could just imagine the families of uh, of the hostages saying, just come, just just show up. I'm ready. Just come. And I don't know. There was something about the combination of the, the music and the, the lyrics and the vocals all combined that made it very, very powerful to me. And uh, it's I've, I've heard it on the radio a lot while driving around Israel. And it it, it always makes me stop and, and think because it, it's so easy for us to get back to our lives and, you know, go through our day. And we need to remind ourselves throughout our day that there are 130 yeah. something hostages uh, being held in Hamas captivity. Right. <laughs> I'll, I'll just tell you one more, and sure. that is the uh, what they called the Homeland Concert. This had been spread far and wide on social media, so maybe your, your listeners may have seen this already. But this was the uh, organizers wanted to do something grand in support of the hostages. Yeah. So they invited a thousand singers and musicians to come to the amphitheater in, in Caesarea to uh, perform a song. Yeah, called, I saw this. Okay. Yeah, please, please, yes, yes. Called Habaita, uh, a home, which was orig originally came out in, in 1983. And it, at the time, it was recorded as a song urging Israel to pull out of the first Lebanon war and bring their soldiers home. Well, now it's been the, the song has been repurposed and it's a very, very powerful uh, rendition of this song with a thousand people standing in the in the Caesarea amphitheater, this ancient amphitheater uh, and singing their their hearts out with with lots of musicians, drummers, saxophones, guitarists, everything. Uh, and it's a really beautiful, stirring performance. And I highly recommend if you haven't seen it, it's called the Homeland Concert. Well, let's watch a clip of that. Let's take a look at that third category, unity, pride. And I think you've already so spoken about that at the beginning with Amis Chayel Chai, with Eyal Golan. And I know there's more, but please please tell us. Yeah, Am Yisrael Chai is, uh, is probably, like I said, the biggest song to come out of this war right. uh, from that category. One of the other huge songs that have uh, come out of this war is by Yagel Oshri. It's yeah. called Latzet Midikaon. And... You might not recognize the title, but I bet you've seen, you've heard, you've heard the song. Why? Because on every video that you've seen of IDF soldiers reuniting with their families, that song is playing in the background. Uh, it, it, it's an amazing story of a guy who was not a, a household name in Israel beforehand. He had a little bit of a following on TikTok and release uh, the, after the uh, radio station in Israel, the major radio station Gal Galatz rejected this song back in August before the war. Uh, he said, all right, I'll release it on TikTok. And it started to gain a little bit of a following and uh, got some people to take notice. Then October 7th happened. And suddenly this song was everywhere. And it's by far one of the biggest songs of the war. It is utterly beautiful. I love this song. I, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned it. And 
My, I have a four-year-old son, and uh, he sings it, and and he asks for it in the car sometimes. He knows it's sad, but he, you know, he doesn't call it sad. He says the beautiful song. He calls Okay. it the beautiful song. Let's listen to La Set Medica on coming out of getting out of depression. It was a song written before the war. It was Yeah. actually written uh, for a friend of his that was going through a breakup with her boyfriend and he wanted to show her, you know, everything's going to be okay. Don't be bogged down by sadness. And so he wrote that song for her. And uh, everyone uh, embraced it in a big It, way. it, it's so beautiful and, and comforting. Yeah. I, I asked a, an Israeli colleague of mine, uh, a, you know, about what song for her uh, captures it for, you know, this, the music of uh, post-October 7th. She said for her, the song of the war is La Tzet Medikaon. That's the one for her. Um, there, there's one other, I don't know if it's another theme. Perhaps it's under, oh, I, We're, we're under unity. I don't know if you wanted to add something more. Um, I, I mentioned Harbu Darbu, and I want Right. to talk about that one. Right. There, There's unity there too, but there's another element, it seems to me, that I would think we we don't see necessarily in other, it's the music that, come out, that came out of other wars, like this rage, Yes. this anger. And and that song is probably in a category all its own, although I kind of lump it in with this category. But Yeah. uh, essentially, the, the song, the Kharbu Darbu, means uh, it comes from Syrian Arabic and means literally swords and strikes. And uh, the Times of Israel writes, in Hebrew slang, it's a reference to raining hell on one's opponent, which is exactly what the rappers promised the IDF will do to Hamas. And you're right. It, it is an angry song, and but it's also an optimistic song. Showing that yes, we're 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 ready to do what we need to do to protect our country. There are a number of units of the IDF mentioned, and everybody's ready. Everybody's ready to to, as we said, rain hell on on Hamas. And uh, you know, when I played it, for, first of all, this song was number one in Israel for the longest time, and still very much high on the charts on the radio in Israel. When I played it, I, I had listeners that said. Right on, you know. I'm so glad you're you're expressing this. And I had other listeners that said, I, "I don't, I don't like this. I don't feel comfortable with this. This is this is not who we are as as Jewish people. Where we we do what we need to do. We we get the job done. But to to come out with that, come out swinging and say, yeah, let's get them. Let's let's you know, I, they, they 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 that didn't sit well with them. I hear you. I I I, I get both of those. I I. I'm more on that initial side personally, but I do get the second, the, 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 the latter uh, reaction. And I wonder, regarding your listeners, is there a way to tell or do you know if the people who were, was there a division between Israelis uh, and Americans in terms of that, or the all sort of American Jews that were responding to you? I, I say this because it seems to me that the, not embracing of, but... Um, that taking arms, taking, you know, act, action militarily is something that Israelis have uh, not to embrace, but they've had, that's a reality they've had to to uh, embrace, to be part of. It's a reality that they've had to do to survive in the Middle East from the 40s and uh, till, till today. Um, and American Jews, that's not our way because that's not our way. And we, we don't have, we're part of another system here. And uh, so did, was there any sort of delineation between in terms of those responses culturally? Well, it's hard for me to say a little bit because most of my listeners are English speaking Jews from from around the world, Got it. most of whom are, I, I guess, are, are not. We have a decent audience in Israel, but most of my listeners are, are outside of Israel, because if you're a native Hebrew speaker, you don't need me to, to give you more background on, on these songs because it's everywhere. 
Um, but I, I think you're right. I think that by and large, the average Israeli, I mean, the fact that this song was so high on the charts for so long shows the, the real sense of anger towards Hamas, towards uh, this, this incident, towards uh, over, over October 7th. They're hurting. And because of this pain, they want to go in with full force. Here in America, yeah, there are a lot of people who feel exactly the same way. But you know, I'm sure, by the, the the fierce debate that goes on in this country over this war and Israel's response, we read about it every single day, right. that not all American Jews are, are on board. Uh, most of my listeners did like the song a lot, but I did yeah. hear a few a few comments saying, please, you know, this this isn't for me. I, I get I get that and I love the song and I'm curious to see what our listeners think. <laughs> We spoke about how your audience is uh, primarily Anglophones and many, of course, must be American Jews. And you are currently on, on a tour in the States. And we're talking about Israeli music today. And I'm curious to know you know, we, 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 the music, the, the theme that we're talking about today is Israel's musical response to October 7th. What have you seen in terms of the, the American Jewish public? Uh, have Are they in touch with these Israeli songs or is it all completely foreign to them when you talk to them? What's that connection like? In general, American Jews, I find, are not so connected to Israeli music. Uh, and I think that's a shame. Uh, I get it because, unfortunately, Hebrew is a barrier to entry for many. And uh, look, I don't understand every song of of, the, of every song that I play, uh, but I got really connected to Israel by listening to music a long time ago. I didn't grow up with this stuff. Uh, my father was and and still is a cantor as well, and so we had a lot of Jewish music playing in the house, but. Aside from the classics like Hallelujah and Chai and, and Bashan Abba, things like that, I was really ignorant. Once I started listening, whether or not I understood the lyrics totally, I, you know, my Hebrew was decent, but once I once I started listening, I just felt so much more connected because I I would go to Israel. The next time I went to Israel after I got into Israeli music, and I'd be walking around the the, the boardwalk or a, or a mall or sitting in a cafe and I'd, I'd hear these songs and I'd say, oh, I know that song and I, I love that song and I, I love that artist and, and it just made me feel so much more connected. So I say, whether or not you understand the language, just dive in and immerse yourself in this music. You don't understand it, fine. At least it, it just, it kind of washes over you and you, 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 you just feel like you're part of the culture. You get a few words, even better, and if you want, there are lots of sites online. Uh, lyricstranslate.com is, is a great one uh, where you can find translations to a lot of these songs and get a sense of what they're really all about. And once you can pick apart a song and, and truly understand it in Hebrew, you just have a whole new appreciation for it. So I say you don't understand Hebrew, listen anyway, and uh, the rest will follow. Thank you. Do you have, I think this is my my last question for you for this uh, interview, and do you have a favorite in terms of a, a musical Israeli songs that have come out post-October 7th? Do you have a favorite? If so, why? What makes it, what gets it, what gets to you? That's a, a very difficult question. Um, I will tell you, it's, it's kind of an unusual choice, but in terms of a, a music video, there is a, a, a klezmer group of all things out of Australia. Okay. Uh, and one of my listeners sent this to me. She's from Australia and she likes to, to 
you clue me in on what's going on in, in the Jewish community in Australia. And it's a, an Australian klezmer group called Chutney. And they covered a, a famous, not even that famous, but a, a, an older Israeli song by Shiri Maimon. Oh. Shiri has always been one of my absolute favorites. And they decided to use this song, Kama At Yafa, How Beautiful You Are, uh, to express their their understanding of all that's gone on ever since October 7th. The the music video, I think, is more significant than the actual lyrics. And in this music video, they are showing, yes, at first, the scenes of despair and tragedy that came out uh, around the time of October 7th. But quickly, they switch gears into these images of unity and love and helping each other and they show a video from the uh, rally in Washington, D.C. with 300,000 people and all these wonderful expressions of love for Israel from around the world. And to me, it is extremely inspiring. And I tear up every time I watch it and uh, highly recommend. <laughs> What a way to end our conversation by choosing a song that isn't an is from the, the the performers are not Israeli, and yet we're bridging this Jewish world, and we are tied to the, our our ancestral homeland. And I've heard many people in my community and and beyond who may not have felt that way pre October seventh, and then the relevance of this homeland, regardless of politics, um, has has struck them, how important it is. And to have this song that you mentioned, this the idea of unity, of love, and that it comes, and you mentioned the Washington rally, this idea that it's, we are one people, we are am echad. Um, and there's something regarding music that gets us where words fail us. And you mentioned that at the beginning. These artists have found the words and also the melodies that can capture ideas and sentiments, emotions that we can't capture with words. And uh, thank you very, very much, Josh, for sharing these gems with us, for sharing your insights and your passion for uh, for this music. Uh, if everyone, I encourage you to listen to Israel Hour Radio. Where can we where can we watch this? Where can we watch your show? Well, uh, for it. watching our show, it's available on Facebook Live mm -hmm. every Sunday morning uh, at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. And uh, also as a podcast, we're available wherever you get your podcast, whether it's Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Just search for Israel Hour Radio, or you can go to our website, myisraelimusic.com. Josh Schroen, thank you for joining me on Proudly Jewish. Thank you. Thank you.